It is really good to be here and thank you for the invitation. Um, so following Paul, who seems to be the absolute consummate insider for this group, I really am a bit of an outsider. Um, but as an outsider, what I'd like to do is to try and invite you into uh, show you a bit of my world of spatial modelling. And then I hope that we can then make some sort of links between your world and my world. But first of all, I really want to just say thank you. Thank you to everyone here who's made it easier to work with spatial data, uh, who's written open source software, who's made data freely available, because that gives breadth and possibilities to our work um, that, that's just so valuable for ecology and conservation, and we really do deeply appreciate that. So I'm from the Quantitative and Applied Ecology Group here at Melbourne University and I also sit within the Centre of Excellence for Biosecurity Risk Analysis. And my research focuses on what we call species distribution models and these are models that help us to answer some of the fundamental questions of ecology. So things like why does a species occur where it occurs or where could it occur? And so most often these are sort of statistical model and we're relying on the idea that environment is largely affecting where species occur. So when I'm talking about species, I'm talking about, you know, trees, plants, um, birds, etc. cetera. Um, uh, so we're combining observations of the species occurrence or abundance at a site or location and, and we're matching that with environmental data at those same locations and we're fitting them in a model and then we can use that model to predict to new locations provided we know the environment at those locations. And so clearly with things like rasters of environmental information, that allows us to make rasters of, of predictions right across landscapes. Uh, now these I'm calling species distribution models, people call them ecological niche models, habitat suitability models, so if you've heard of anything like that, they're, they're similar models. And some of the earliest work in this sort of area was um, done by Australians. Um, so, for instance, here we've got the modelled responses of nine different eucalypt species to temperature on the x-axis, probability of occurrence on the y-axis, fitted in a generalised linear model. And um, the, the point of this is just to say the shape of these sorts of curves, the optima we look at, the skews, they help to tell us about species and they help us to understand what's going on, they help us to think about vegetation theory. Um, this is just one example of the idea that when we use these models we want to understand what's going on and we want to understand species distribution, species distributions. And there's many examples like that um, within countries and right globally uh, that help us to understand what's driving the distributions of species. And that, as you can imagine that's important in, in ecology, it's important in conservation. Uh, but a lot of um, what the modern interest is in the predictions from these models. And so these here are the records for cane toads in Australia up to 2006. Um, you can see that they're more dense in some areas than others. We've got gaps between the records. And so when we map predictions, um, that it helps us to fill in the gaps, essentially, and, and give a continuous surface of predictions across landscapes. So for cane toads, for instance, some of our predictions look like this. And so once you've got these map predictions, um, they can be used for things like um, in a, a large landscape like this, we might think about where do I um, go to survey for a rare species? Uh, if someone's going to clear land in this area, uh, what species might be flagged in an area that's been flagged for clearing? Or we might sort of be asking which are the most environmentally suitable areas here for species reintroductions or for translocations. Or if I'm going to set up a reserve, where do I put it so that I can um, cover the largest number of species that I'm interested in? So lots and lots of uses for these sorts of predictions. And then increasingly now, um, these sorts of models are being used to predict to new times and new places. So predicting distributions in the future under climate change, um, or predicting, for instance, uh, what's the likelihood that an invasive species that somewhere else is going to come to Australia and find climatically suitable areas in Australia or whichever country. So these are sort of fairly challenging and controversial uses of these sorts of models because we're often extending the models way past um, what's known, but they're really in high demand as you can imagine because we're trying to answer some really important questions for conservation planning and, and for management of species. So the models are very popular, 
um, lots of potential uses. But of course, there's always challenges to fitting models and getting predictions that have got some sort of reasonable basis to them. So I just want to show you some of the sorts of data that we use. So here, for instance, this is a PhD student of mine from a few years ago, and she's collecting records of biological soil crust species in Victoria. So you can see these data are very hard won. Right? Um, we might have trouble identifying species. Uh, we might end up with quite small samples because it takes so long. Um, but at least for these sorts of data, we can design the surveys and we know how much effort we've put into collecting the data, and that's important in our models. And then we've also got large data sets. So, so this data set here that I, that I had a picture of before um, are from these, these marine research trawls. Um, they're data I work with with my colleague John Leithwick in New Zealand, and it's a very rich data set. So there's 17,000 marine research trawls. Now, they've got their own challenges. You know, between trawls, they change their gear or they change their trawl speed and things like that. But at least the data set's fairly, very large and reasonably well known. Now, um, traditionally, these sorts of, of data have been owned by ecologists or, or management agencies, and in the past, they haven't been openly available. But the idea of open data and reproducible codes now becoming more mainstream for us. This is a couple of examples from the British Ecological Society. Um, and we're thinking of ways to reward ecologists um, who collect the data to give them incentives to make <coughs> them available to other people. But it is a continuing process, and the availability of data for us is an ongoing issue. Uh, but most commonly, we have a lot of species records that are incidental records. So they're not necessarily parts of surveys. They've just been collected by a whole lot of people. And I guess um, many of you will know these online portals. So this is a global biodiversity information facility. Um, it's now got about a billion records in it of species occurrences. Um, and here, for instance, uh, redder areas are where we've got more records. And so in Australia, the equivalent is the Atlas of Living Australia, which now has 79 million occurrence records. So one of the missions of these sorts of portals is to get information out of the cabinets and drawers of museums and collectors and get them all in one place. And they've done a great job at that, and it's a really good idea. But these sort of data haven't been collected with modelling in mind, and they've got, uh, they tend to have all sorts of biases. So, for instance, this is from the Atlas of Living Australia. These are all bird records from 1990 to 2000. And you can see in these maps um, roads, right? You can see, you can see um, these horizontal lines here are the flight paths that our ecologist Richard Kingsford flies on every year to, to look at um, wetland birds. Um, and you can see that we've got more data from some states than others. Now, this is uh, problematic for modelling because it's not just showing us what conditions are suitable for species, it's also showing us where people like to observe things and where they submit data from. Um, and it's very hard to tease the two apart in models. So we call this sort of data presence only data, and I'll, I'll, I'll use that name a bit, because we've only got a record of where the species has been found, so the presence of the species, and we don't have records of places that have been searched without finding the, the species. Now, as I said, there's data sets like this right throughout the world, and often it's the only data that we've got available for a species that we're trying to model. And I will come back to this later, because um, this really is a major difficulty for us, getting sensible models out of data like this. But the other side to our data needs are the predictor variables, so these environmental covariates here in our models. And um, here again, we're making a lot of use of open data and, and perhaps data that you might be generating. So our primary need here is for data that can explain the distribution um, of the species. And so these species might be on land or in rivers or in oceans. Um, the, the models are primarily fitted with environmental covariates. So um, and really that that should be whatever is relevant to the species. So commonly we use long-term average climate data, but for instance for some species, more, local, more recent weather data might be much more um, relevant. Uh, it might be soil properties, it might be terrain, terrain measures. So conceptually we're just looking for predictors that are going to drive the distribution of species. And then we might also be interested in other covariates, so things that have impacted the distribution of species, things like uh, fire frequency or clearing of land. 
and then we might want predictors that will explain um, some of the biases in, a, in the observation e efforts, so things like distance to road or ruggedness of the landscape that will tell us about how hard it is to get into a place. Uh, now, the other thing about predictive variables is we tend to prefer continuous variables rather than classified ones. So, for instance, I would much rather have continuous data on soil fertility at any one site than a soil class. Um, and that's both technically because they're easier to deal with in, in models and they use less parameters, but also because often the way one person will class data isn't at all relevant for the species I'm interested in. So those are um, the sorts of things we want for predictors. And then in case you're interested, uh, we use um, models both from statistics and machine learning and we adapt them um, for different sampling designs and different types of species data. And here's a few examples. And some of these have standalone um, packages, but a lot of us use the free statistical software R, um, both for modelling our species, for making predictions and for dealing with GIS data. Um, so that's a very quick run through some of the sorts of data and models that we use. And now I thought I'd show you a few examples of where these sorts of species distribution models are used in practice. So my first example is from Haney Huyala, a postdoc in our group. And she's an expert in what we call spatial prioritisation methods for conservation planning. And she uses species distribution models as input to her prioritisation work. And so this is um, research with Brendan Wintle and Amy Whitehead, also from our group. And thanks to Haney for these slides. So Haney was working with planners in Western Australia to figure out how to minimise development impacts in the Perth Peel region. So this is the region in blue here, Perth somewhere about here. Um, and so this southwest corner of Western Australia is a biodiversity hotspot. It's one of, one of the most biodiverse regions of the world. Um, but it does have a long history of human activities, and so it's estimated that we've already cleared about 71% of the land there. Um, so that's, of course, impacted biodiversity, and uh, 12 mammal, mammal species are now extinct from that, locally from that area, and there's been severe declines in for, uh, 46 the population of 46 other bird species. Um, now, the other complication is that uh, this area is, is one of the most rapidly expanding regions, and so it's estimated that by 2050, the population will have expanded from 2 million people to 3.5 million. And so the aim of this work was to ask, can we plan future development um, in a way that minimises impacts on biodiversity? So, in this area, there were 226 species and communities that they thought needed attention. And so, first of all, Haney modelled those with open source species occurrence data, open source predictive variables, and free uh, modelling software. And so, then they want to account for impacts on these species. So, here we've got mapped um, forecasts for urban expansion, for industrial footprints, for forestry mining. And they needed to, to work on these together because usually it's a cumulative impacts of, of these sorts of things that affect biodiversity. So these sorts of data aren't open source. Um, they, were, uh, they were available um, from the Perth planning scheme and so Haney and her colleagues needed to set up a trusted partnership to make sure that they can talk together with the data. And so once they had the input models and the input data, Haney used a, um, a planning tool called Zonation that essentially simulates continued human expansion in, the, in a region. And it calculates how that expansion should be done to minimise impacts on biodiversity. And so this is what it looks like in action. So the blue areas here are locations where biodiversity can accommodate development. So where land clearing will lead to relatively um, lower rates of biodiversity loss. And then the more red the colour, the more important that area is for biodiversity and the more damage we would do if we developed it. Right, so we get output like that. And then, so one of the most valuable things in this project is that Haney and her colleagues could work iteratively with the planners. So this is a planner's first um, proposal and the areas in red are areas that are impacting biodiversity in fairly severe ways. And so in this initial proposal you'll see 20% of the remnant vegetation was going to be developed and on average across all the species about 21% of their habitat will have been lost. And so the idea was Haney and, and, and her colleagues would 
um, give them that feedback. They would go back, do some more planning. They would see how that changed. And so there were iterations of the, of the um, development. And then in the end, the final revision, you can see there 12 per cent um, remnant vegetation being developed and um, a 12 per cent impact roughly on species as well. So, so that's dropped down from the initial 20 per cent. And that's significant in this area. So, so um, this growth plan is still being finalised, but it has been clear that if you do smart planning, um, you can significantly reduce the impacts on species. And so that's, I think it's a nice example. So, so my second example is from Casey Visenton, also in, in um, our quantitative ecology group here, and thanks to Casey for these slides. So, so this is Casey's PhD work, and um, it's based in Victoria. And so his idea is he wants to predict the risk of collision between wildlife and vehicles, and he's using spatial models of exposure and hazard. So the data on exposure he gets from species distribution models, and the data from, from on hazard he gets, um, he gets spatial data on traffic volumes and speed. So in a bit more detail, the species distribution modelling part of it used open access data again um, from spatial repositories like the Atlas of Living Australia to train the models and the predictive variables are also open source. Um, and so here, for instance, we see model distributions of wombats and wallabies and possums and kangaroos and koalas. So species they are interested in. And then to get yeah. estimates of traffic speed and volume, sorry, it's a bit pale, some of this, um, Casey used data from OpenStreetMap and from Google Maps, and he combined that with other information from other open access administrative and census data. And then he did this using spatial databases and QGIS and R, and he combined all this in models that could then predict speed and volume for each of the 600,000 road segments in Victoria, so it's about 150,000 kilometres of road. So once he had species information, traffic speed and volume information. He combined all those in a model uh, and then he could make predictions of collision risk for any road segment in Victoria. And so now he has estimates of collision risk on all those roads and, the, and this information now is stored as GIS data and the idea is it can be useful for road authorities to manage roads. So he also worked on train networks and he's modelled um, collision risk on train networks. And so here he's thinking about um, variation in both space and time for trains. Um, he, got, he got data from the Public Transport um, Authority of Victoria as a general transit feed specification format. Um, and so he ended up with data on train speed and volume, um, train speed and number of trains for every hour uh, for one day of the month, each month of the year, for every cell on the rail network. Um, and then he also had information on distribution of kangaroos and he had information on the diurnal activities of, of kangaroos. And so he could then make predictions, predict the risk of collisions um, between trains and kangaroos for any rail segment for any time of the day or year. And so the longer term plan for this sort of work is to develop integrated systems. So Casey's um, been working on this side here. Um, he wants to, um, to, to gather um, more data from the public from, uh, and from open source repositories to model risk and to provide informative outputs and then um, to interface with mobile devices to warn motorists. So the idea is you'd get a warning sort of saying you're travelling in an area with lots of wildlife, if you reduce your speed, you know, you've got this much less chance of a collision, that sort of idea. So it's a very nice application of modelling for both um, wildlife and for people using open um, data. So my last example um, is, is about how these models can be used for disease modelling. So this is an interview that we recorded in 2016 for one of our subjects. It's just a quick interview with, um, between uh, Jose Lajas Monfort, one of our lecturers in our group, and Nick Golding, who's a research fellow here. And um, I think you'll find this interesting on disease. So could you tell us a bit more to start with about modelling the distribution of disease and disease vectors? I mean, can you give us some examples of, of these? Sure. Yeah, so the approach is pretty similar to uh, 
working in conservation and mm -hmm. making a map that's useful of where something is. But yeah, in epidemiology, the object is a disease or a disease vector. Um, so yeah, the disease we've worked on recently, Zika virus, obviously, because there's been uh, an outbreak, a large outbreak in South America. Uh, and previously, we mapped the, the vectors of, of uh, Zika to mosquitoes. Uh, and before that, Ebola did some work on avian influenza as well. Oh, that's some pretty important diseases. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so yeah, often they uh, there's a desperate need for maps and very little data. Yeah. Yeah. So what makes modeling the distributions of um, of disease different than than of wildlife, for example? So fundamentally, the models are the same, but it's the the data that goes in. Um, I mean, often it's presence only as well. It's, again, not the only data that's available. But the sources of bias in that are, are going to be slightly different from the conservation side of things. So it's not that you do plant surveys, but it might be where people report to health facilities, and therefore it might be more likely that you get disease reported in large cities. Uh, and also the covariates that go in it tend to be different as well. So poverty is quite a big predictor for a lot of diseases. So understanding sort of metrics of that socioeconomic variables like that are important. Yeah. And how are these models used in practice then once you produce a map of the disease or even the, the vector? So there are a couple of different uh, applications and one of them is just advocacy, just saying, look, we need to do something about this disease, it's everywhere. Um, but there's also, you know, for planning, if you want to go and do better surveillance for a disease. So some work that some colleagues of mine did on and dengue um, was actually used to inform the, the global burden of dengue, so how many cases there are. Uh, and we also did some work recently combining different maps to work out areas where there are vector-borne diseases, so mosquito and fly-borne diseases, in the same location. So it might be worth targeting lots of them at the same time. Right. Back up again. Can you hear still? Yes, good. Um, so, so there are lots of really interesting and compelling applications for these species distribution models that I work on. But of course, if we're going to make important um, decisions about urban planning or about um, reducing vehicle collisions or understanding disease spread, <laughs> based on these distribution models, we really want to be reasonably sure that we've got a fairly firm foundation um, that we're working on. Or if not, we want to know how we're going to deal with uncertainty. So I'd just like to finish with a few thoughts on things that are important to us as modelers and users of data that might spark some thoughts for some of you. So, so data quality is very important to us. And here, first of all, I'm thinking about the species data. We do want to be modelling the environments that are suitable for a species. We don't want to be modelling the um, habits of, of observers. And so we do work quite hard on dealing with bias in, the, in this presence-only species data. And it's been part of the focus of my work is working out how we can deal with those sorts of biases within the models. But the reality is that these sorts of biases are really challenging to work with and to, to deal with. And mostly we're making some fairly worrying compromises um, that we'd rather not make. Um, so we'd really much rather have better quality data. We do want to know about survey effort. We want to know about where people have searched and not found species. So we want to know about absences as well as presences. Um, and one thing that's been very useful recently is the online portals are moving towards representing their data more fully. So I talked about these sort of data as presence only data. But the re reality is that really they're a mixture of presence only data and presence absence survey data. Um, and it's just that we, the only way we could discover them was as presence only data. And so, um, in other words, there's a whole lot of information that really was there that we just couldn't discover. So, so recently there's been enhancements to the data standards of portals, and so that's going to mean that increasingly we can discover the depth of these data. So that's, that's really useful for us. But of course, collecting good quality um, data right from the outset is, is very, very valuable for us. And I just want to show this example of eBirds. Some of you might know about this. So this is the online checklist program for birders run out of Cornell University in the US. And they started close to 20 years ago. And I think they're a really good example of collecting citizen science data in a way that's that's made the data very well suited to science. So um, they worked out right from the beginning how they could get scientifically useful data from birders because they worked with the birders right from the beginning. They found out the sorts of things that would incentivise um, birders. 
um, so that they would get the sort of information from the birders that they could use. So, for instance, um, they, they, birders love checklists, right? If you, you can see I'm not a birder. I have no, no lists at all. But um, they love checklists, and so they've developed a whole lot of uh, facility for the birders to get lists of their observations, for them to map their observations, for, the, for them to compare their lists with somebody else. Um, there's about 400,000 birders using um, eBird um, worldwide. As people um, put their information in, they ask various questions about effort. And that's, so that's really important to ask in interpreting whether a bird might have been at a place and just not observed if the, if the effort wasn't uh, as much as you might need to detect a bird. And then they, um, they pre-populate their submission forms with um, species previously submitted in the, in the region at the time of year that the survey has gone on. So if you as a birder came in and you said, I, I saw something or other, um, and it's never been seen at that time or place before, they will then ask you more information about, really, you know, how do you know it was that and what did you hear or see? And so um, that's really giving them much more reliable information. And then in the background in eBird, there's got a whole lot of machine learning algorithms that start learning about you as a birder. And so if you're really reliable, your observations are going to make a lot more difference to their models than somebody who's a bit erratic. Um, and so it's just given them really, really useful information. Now, I've mentioned um, survey effort, but of course the whole issue of data quality is much wider than that. So for species data, we want to know things about how accurate the lo locations are, whether the species was reliably identified, was it, was it reliably detected. Um, so for pr predictors, we want to know what sorts of errors are available in them. So if you're providing data, any information that can give us idea on accuracy or reliability is really useful. Uh, because in the end, where we want to get to is we want to be able to deal with uncertainty routinely and in more sophisticated ways than what we do now. So currently, some distribution modellers either try to reduce uncertainty by fixing errors or by averaging models, um, or they might display uncertainty. So, for example, my colleague Haney here has mapped the agreement between different methods in predicting distributions into the future of amphibians and frogs in Europe. Um, or we try and think about uncertainty from the decision viewpoint. So if I'm, going to make, um, if I'm going to make conservation areas, which ones are most robust to uncertainty? So here in the red, she's mapped those uh, areas that come up as good conservation sites, regardless of uncertainty in models. Uh, so some of us try and work on uncertainties, but it really is a very undeveloped area for us. And, and I think one, more, one where more information on data quality or more ideas about how to assess uncertainty or to visualise it would be really helpful. Uh, until recently, we haven't been great as modellers at documenting all the details of our analyses or making code and data available, but thankfully that's gradually changing. And so we've got moves for reproducibility of analyses. So this is Zoom, a package in R. And so the idea here is there'll be a workflow and there'll be modules contributed. And those modules will be available to everyone. And once I've fitted a model with um, my code and data would be made available to everybody else. And if you wanted to rerun models and make different choices to me, you could do that. And that way we should build up a repository of information and learning. Um, so, so we're hoping that that'll make um, things more transparent and it'll help us to build on ideas and show the impact of various steps that we make in the modelling process. And then we care about things like how do we evaluate our models well. So these are just a couple of examples um, of work from our group that's been used looking at how do we make structured cross-validations to test our models well in different um, places. So, for instance, we might test, we might think about testing our um, models on different parts of geographic space or environmental space. So here the different colours are showing different folds of a training and testing cross-validation. And we would, we would test our models on one of the colours and train them on all the others and cycle through the data. So the idea here is does my model transfer well to a different area or a different environments? Or we might want to test will it predict well to a different time? Or these are data from elk in Canada, their home ranges of elk. And so you might sort of say, we've got a whole lot of locations within any one home range. I'm going to hold all that data together and test on maybe an individual that's further away. 
So this idea of how we reliably test our models is important for us. Um, and this is software that one of our students, Ruth Berkelov, has just written in, in R again to implement some of this um, cross-validation. It's got some very nice um, tools, including some really nice R shiny visualisations of his code. And we're always interested in tools that will help us to probe and understand our predictions. So this, for instance, is an interactive map of predictions. And if it was interactive, really, you click on any one cell here and you can look at the modelled responses and you can see where you are in the environment at any one, for any one of the predictor variables and you can see what is going together in the model to make up the prediction. So this is helping us to sort of probe our predictions and it's important because especially with messy data sets where we really want to understand what's going on, we need tools like that that help us to sort of work out are we, behave, are we modelling something sensible or are we modelling nonsense. Because we really where we want to get to is we want to get to reliable predictions. So this is again from eBird. These are predictions of the magnolia warbler. And here, lighter colours are higher abundances, and you'll see at the very top, time is ticking by. So this model um, and others like it are possible because of the quality of data that eBird now get. Um, and they've invested in computer scientists and statisticians who have developed models that suit these data well. Now, eBird now get over a million observations every month. So some of their models are so well supported by data and evaluation that they're feeding into really important conservation decisions about critical habitats. So I think it's a really nice use of, um, of spatial data for biodiversity modelling. OK, so that's a bit of, of my world. I really hope that we've got some opportunities to talk about the links between yours and mine in the next couple of days, or please do email me with any thoughts that you have. Thank you.